Somos Viña. We are Vineyard. I envision in five to 10 years, the level of connectedness among our churches is going to be very high. And when there's unity too, I think it allows the Holy Spirit to flow way more. So we're going to see more of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit moving, the kingdom coming. I just see real health and the kind of a clear call moving forward and moving forward together. I think this role of SRLs, now there are like three people full time. I know for Brenda, Joel, myself, that every morning we get up and we're thinking, how can we help the local church? You know, we got our hands in helping someone through crisis. We got a hand in casting vision, empowering leaders, uh, bringing healing. And that's like a 150 hours a week that we never had. Yep. That's going into caring for local churches and pastors. Welcome to the We Are Vineyard podcast, conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. In today's episode, our host, Jay Pathak, talks to John Elmer, a super regional leader for Vineyard USA. Let's listen in. Well, John, thanks for joining me to do this podcast. Oh, it's great to be here with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was trying to think about when I first got to know you. I think it must have been in the regional stuff, right? Was it the uh, church planning with when we were both regional? Yes. Yeah. When we were both at a church. Was it, I don't know that it was before that. I mean, I'm sure we were in meetings, but as far as just like spending time together and getting to know one another, I don't think it was until we're in those meetings trying to figure out how we're supposed to plant churches. Yeah, that was that was where we first connected. And one of my favorite moments with you in those meetings, there's many, by the way. <laughs> We're on Steve Nicholson's team for church planning for the vineyard. One of my favorite moments is, you know, we've done all this work for, at the time, I think it was the seven-step church yeah. planting process. Yeah. And in the meeting, we're all just bemoaning, like, nobody even knows what this is. People aren't doing this. Like, they skip steps. They, they come to us later, they, you know. People are just making up whatever they want, blah, 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 blah. And right there at the table, you look at me and you just, you just slap $20 on the table and go, I will pay you $20 right now if you can do all seven steps. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, pretty quiet I, in the room at that I moment. don't think I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go, I don't think I can either. <laughs> so it was, it was a good moment to realize, well, However clear we think we're being, maybe we're not as clear as we, as we think we are. But anyway, I just, I love those meetings with you. It was lots of, it was lots of laughing. There was a lot of, a lot of laughter and a lot of, a lot of fruitfulness in us, but it was a lot of laughter. Seriously, it was. Yeah. I mean, and you know, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've listened to every single one of these, taken diligent notes. <laughs> me- of course. <laughs> memorized of course. everybody's stories, but, but just in case you haven't. I just love to hear a bit of your story, and then I'd love to move that toward kind of what you're doing as an SRL at this point, a super regional leader, uh, the name that we could not seem to get away from. No matter what, no matter how many names we came up with, I, I've recently had someone recommend that we we could use the same letters, SRL, and you could become a supreme realm lord. Wow. What do you, wow. <laughs> it has a nice ring to it. <laughs> it might be hard to fit on a Christmas card, but I like it. <laughs> Supreme realm. So it's a realm, Lord. So anyway, tell me a little about where you grew up. You grew up in Syracuse, right? Where yeah, you are? born and raised in Syracuse. Um, grew up in an a Italian Catholic family. Really had nothing to do with, I didn't have any real connection at all with God or anything. I mean, Went to mass with the family and stuff. Right. Nothing stuck. Right before my senior year in high school, I came home one night. It was late, summer, about two in the morning. Come home, I, you know, stoned high and drunk and came in the house, sat down. I didn't want to go across the living room to turn the TV on because the room was spinning. I didn't want to wake my mom up, get grounded well, a little bit. And, and you're, you're old enough that it was by hand, I imagine. That's right. 
There's that's right. That's right. <laughs> it wasn't looking for the remote. Yeah. <laughs> it was finding the on off button. Yeah. You had to go and then you had to turn those dials. You know, click, and if you click, click. if you were in I'm the not view. quite that old. I think no? we did have a but the remote had like it was like a box and you had a string to it. <laughs> oh, so, okay. so it was literally Okay, like so it wasn't box. the it wasn't a. It wasn't. It was, I, by my high school, I was past that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Just, I'm not as old as I look. Just, 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 <laughs> just check. Well, I remember. I remember having to do the. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so anyway, yeah. okay. So, so you're stoned, three, you're high, you're drunk. Three, you can't find the wired. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can't find the wired remote. And so I just sit there for a moment, and there's a Bible on the table right next to the door because I sat in this chair right next to the door, and. We never read the Bible or anything, but I had gotten kicked out of public school, went to parochial high school, had to buy a Bible class, religion class, gave it to a guy when I was cleaning out my rock locker the year before, said, hey, you'll need this to pass religion to take it. He brings it back that night. Somebody just put it, you know, like, oh, OK, I'll give it to him, put it on his table. I open it up and the spirit of God starts speaking to me. Hmm. And it was like, look how empty you are. And like there was these, the Lord just kind of gave me this like scene in my life, you know, these different scenes of, you know, I did well in athletics and wrestling, state champ or runner up and stuff like that. And like being there and having people cheer and going like to myself inside at that moment, there's got to be more to life than this, you know, and, yeah. you know, getting high with my friends, I showed me a scene in the backyard and just like, as I'm doing it, saying there's got to be more to life than this and just seeing that there's scene in my my life then like saying there's got to be more and he's just he so wait let, let me ask a question about that so so and I, and this might sound like a minor detail but it's i think it's interesting in relationship to kind of even what we do as pastors mm -hmm. was it reading a particular passage like is it like there's this or was it almost a metaphysical like moment in relationship to somehow as i just sort of go to look at the Bible, even the spirit of God starts to engage me. I mean, I, and, and it sounds like a minor difference, but it is kind of interesting. Like it's how later. much of it's intellectual, how much of it's just a, an encounter. I, it, it was an encounter. It yeah. was, I don't even remember what I read. I don't even know if I read, I just grabbed and kind of started flipping it on. Like, you know how you like sitting there and you know, I got to grab something and, and yeah, it was that. Wow. And it's this encounter, which I had no grid for this, right. nothing. And there's this like, look how empty you are. And bang, 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 these pictures of this emptiness. And this this kind of cry my soul, well, what can fill me? Hmm. And it was as clear as I think I've ever, I mean, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was clear as could be, yeah. I can. And at that moment, you know, from my Catholic background, I kind of knew it was Jesus. And... Uh, and my response was, hey, Jesus, I know you lived and died 2,000 years ago, and I know you're in heaven. I mean, I picked that much up in, in, in mass, and I know there's a bunch of angels around you. Yeah. But if you care about this kid who's caused so much stuff, uh, I, I, I want to just say I'm sorry for hurting people because I knew mm. I hurt people. I hurt my mom. I hurt you know, lots of people. I mean, we all do, right? Yeah. And I'm sorry. And if... If you can fill this emptiness, hmm. I, 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 I will, I will do whatever you want. I'm, I'm yours. Like, wow. Fill this. And Jay would happen sitting there in that chair. I, the only way I could explain, it, I had no language for any of this. And right. the way I explained it was like, there's this pitcher of liquid peace was poured into me. Now I know it was the Holy Spirit. As I said, take me, you know, I'm yours. Yeah. But Jesus, like I get the Holy Spirit, but there's this, this wave of, the presence of God and peace. And I wow. mean, I just sat there in my living room going, ah, it was, it was incredible. Um, changed well, and, my life. and I mean, I think I, I, I don't remember us, you know, as long as we've been friends and had time together, I don't remember us talking about this in that you and I stories are very, very similar hmm. in that I had an encounter reading the scriptures in my room, very similar in that I was just sort of fumbling around. It wasn't like I have this really clear, dedicated plan to like seek God or whatever. Right, right, right. But it's like a Bible I have. 
I knew I had some kind of existential hunger that I didn't know what to do with. I'm giving this Bible to Young Life Meeting. Mine's different in that I've been reading the Bible for a while. Hmm. But my encounter with God happened in reading a very specific passage. So I've been reading all this stuff. I mean, Genesis all the way up to Romans wow. 7 and 8. It's like a year later. Wow. But it's not like this organized, you know, and obviously I'm skipping stuff, like all the lists of people who begat whoever, whatever, you know, all those things. Like we still do 50 years right? into this. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> totally. Yeah, all scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, and you're like, well, let's let's not do this genealogy. We're gonna Anyway. I know people that do. It's it's impressive to me when they yeah. can. Actually, yeah. strangely, those are pretty good sermons when people spend the time to do that. But then I have this encounter with God very similar. I, I've always described it was like warm jello that I was like breathing in and out. It felt thicker than liquid, but it wasn't like air, you know, have this en encounter. And then I'm trying to figure out what does this mean? I have like an interesting thought about this I can say, as I reflect on this myself. And I wonder if it would be true for you. Because this happened for me around the scriptures, reading the Bible, there's something inherent inside of me where I don't, I don't personally, and in my mind and in my heart, feel a disconnect between experiencing the spirit and loving the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. Like, like yeah. for me, there's never been, like when I look at how many believers I know have been raised in church and whatever, they often are like, man, I really struggle with the Bible or feeling like, is this really like the word of God or what's, what's, how does this work? And it feels kind of dry or confusing. And it's not to say that I don't have difficulties when I read the scriptures. So there's pieces I don't quite understand or that feel out of place or out of tune with what I naturally would think about God. Right. But that other thing that happens where people sort of devalue or the authority of scripture becomes like lesson in their life. I've never experienced. Yeah. yeah. Because like, that's how I encountered <laughs> Jesus. Is, do you have a similar, I mean, have you ever yeah. contemplated this? Yeah. Well, what happened? So I have this experience and go to bed. I wake up the next morning going like, what just happened? I feel different. Yeah. This right. thing happened. So what I did right from the beginning, I had this experience of the spirit. It was tied to the word in some way. Yeah. So the next day, you know, and I was kind of, I like to read. I, I was reading all kinds of stuff. I, I would, I went out in the backyard, got high, went back in, put my headphones on, put on Dark Side of the Moon and started reading the scriptures. Like that's how I read at that time. Like Dude, that was the atmosphere. I love everything in order. You just said there. <laughs> and, and I'm reading the scriptures and it's like, this is like great. And this is the grace of God. For like two weeks, I do that, right? And then finally, it's just this sense from the Holy Spirit going like, hey, you don't have to get high to read the scriptures. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, and I just start reading them, you know? And then like about a week later, you could probably drop the headphones the dark side of the moon, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the connection, this is what's so interesting to me. The connection between an encounter with God and the scriptures was fundamental. It's like at the beginning of everything. So it even listening to your story right now, it takes a minute for the Holy Spirit to tell you, hey, there's these other things you probably need to attend to. <laughs> right. But what was clear from the beginning is, no, there's something about reading the Bible and encountering the Spirit that synced up inside of you. And it probably exists to, to this day. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, because, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I'm going to make a second weird assumption that, out of my story, which is the other thing for me is early then I would go to this coffee shop before I go to school and I would read the Bible and pray without any idea how to do it. Right. It's just like, I don't know. This is what I'm doing. That is so ingrained in me to this day that if I smell coffee, okay, like, like I, <laughs> I walk into a coffee shop. I'm not, you're going to, you're going to think you need this, this, you're going to think weird things about me starting right now, but it's okay. You probably already think a number of them. It's already started. It's yeah, already exactly. started. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I smell coffee, 
something neurologically for me, hmm. I I actually have a sense like the Holy Spirit's here. Hmm. Like so many of those early experiences of reading the Bible and like, I don't know how to describe it other than the sense of revelation. You know, like there's these, mm-hmm. oh my goodness, like Jesus is so interesting or he's so mm-hmm. intense or he's so compelling or, or, you know, you read like a thought and you're like, wow, like God is so strong or he's so yeah. kind or whatever. And, but somewhere in like, I don't know if it's in my neurology. I don't know if it's like <laughs> metaphysical or existential or whatever, but those things all got kind of synced together. Mm. And so I wonder even like for you, like if you get to hear dark side of the moon, are you like the Lord? The Lord is here. I do. I think dark side. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's a sense like I can worship that. You know that 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 maybe not all the words, okay? But but that, that, yeah. But no, and I I'm not even saying it. it's not good or bad. It's just it, it's, it's just this remembrance, and I bring it back to that moment where that's right. Everything yes. was so fresh and so wonderful. Yes. And, yes. And the, and the 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 really great thing that God did for me. So I have this thing. I have no, I don't know anybody who's a Christian at this point. I mean, if I do, they're good, doing a good job hiding it. And I am, you know, reading my scriptures and, you know, just kind of praying and kind of connecting. This priest who, his name is Father Buckham. He connects with me. He sees hmm. me go to mass, like, and going like, okay, what's going on? Yeah, what's this kid this, doing here? Yeah. And he knew me from the dark side, if you will. And, right. and so he says, Hey, let's saw me pursued me. This is great leadership. Wow. He saw me knew I was kind of a leader because, and then says, Hey, let's have, let's, let's go get some pizza. So he does. And he says, Hey, what's going on? And I tell him this story, you know, what happened? And I said, you know, this Jesus is great. You should try him. Like, you know, and, and, and he, he says, that's great. You know, encourages me about a week later calls me and says, I got a friend of yours I'm having pizza with. I want you to come with us. I'm going like free pizza. Great. Brings me there. And he says, tell him what happened to you. So right away, I'm telling my story. I love it. And I lead this guy. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, but I tell him my story. The guy says, I want that. Commits to Jesus right there in a pizza place. This guy still goes to our church today. The guy. Wait, wait. The guy. This guy. Wow. Yeah. Brian. He still goes to our church and lead him to the Lord. And then this priest, like a week later, says, I, I, I'm two months old in the Lord now. He says, you should start a Bible study. And wow. I say, that'd be great. What's a Bible study? Because I've never been to anything. Right. So just invite some friends, read the Bible together, and then talk about it. So I invite like people, and we had 12 people the first time showing up. And here it is. I'm, I've been following Jesus two months. Yep. There was a guy who had been following Jesus like six months. His name was Pat. So whenever a question came up, we go, well, Pat, so why is there an Old Testament? We say, oh, because it's older. Oh, great. You know, because Pat <laughs> been following Jesus six months. So everything he said was cold, right? Yeah, right. He knows what he's doing, right? Exactly. People start coming to this thing and people are getting saved. And God knows what we were saying. Like, I'm glad we didn't have <laughs> yeah. any, you know, no recordings of that. No yeah, recordings. there's no YouTube Real channel. the reels of it. <laughs> <laughs> but again, there's there's two other people from that original Bible study still in my church. Wow. And, and, and again, just to be clear, Father Buckle is not leading this Bible study. Never went to it. So he he hooks you up with this first guy. Brian, right. right? Is it Brian? Yeah, Brian. Brian has this deal. Then it's like, let's do a Bible study. Okay. And no, nobody is, there's no like adult, like it's like all high school folk. Right. Wow. Right. And how are your parents processing this to the side? I mean, you're. My parents are separate. Uh, my, my mom. Okay. Uh, she thinks I gone off on the deep end. My brother who my younger brother was home. All the other siblings had uh, moved on to college and life. And my younger brother, who knew me as this whole thing, you know, 
Right. And suddenly I'm staying home reading the Bible and running this, and he's coming and to it. But he's like, what happened? And then he'd bring his friends to our house for a party when my mom was out working in the Navy. And I'd be there with him, not drinking or anything, but like sharing the Lord with him. Wow. Like it puts a kind of crimp on, on your, you know, your older brothers hanging out. Like, <laughs> yeah. but, but what's, what's really cool is like one of those guys ends up getting saved. Wow. A couple of years later comes to where I was at. Anyhow, long story short, and he's leading this church uh, in Michigan. I forgot where, where near central Michigan, uh, university of central Michigan is. Mm. He's got this church happening there. That's, you know, I, I don't know what it is post COVID, but it was a, pretty big church seven eight hundred people wow. uh, from that little bible study you know that we did wow. that, like god is so good like empowering that's why i love the venue that's why i felt so at home like everybody gets to play like no one would have let me play at that point in my life except for father buckle i think yeah well and right away happens, i got to use your leadership what happens to father buckle by the way father buckle uh he's passed on now he was one of my biggest cheerleaders. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I went off and when I was in Santa Monica praying about coming to Planet Church in Syracuse, I called him. He was in Syracuse. He's a uh, he's a priest at a, a, a church right near where I'm at now. So what do you think? And he like really encouraged me that you'd be great. Here. You're coming home. You have all these connections. He was a voice in my process. Wow. Uh, and was always my in my corner. Wow. That's incredible, man. Yeah. There's so many interesting parts of that, like exactly what you said. First of all, that kids get to lead, like, sure, go for it. Yeah. Let's see what happens. But then also, I mean, like to think of all the little bits of fruit that flow from that. People that are still in your church, guy planting a church. What an electric and bizarre time. And with like almost no training at all. Right. right. And would you just, I mean, this is going to sound a little specific, but. Was it just we'd sit down and open the Bible? Let's read this. Father Buckle said, he gave me this little commentary. This is a little, tiny little thing. I, I still kept it. I still have wow. it. And it, it was this cheesy little tiny commentary on the book of Mark. Really? And he said, why don't you start with Mark? There's a lot of action, he said, in Mark. That's what we did. We do would go passage. You know, we'd kind of take a passage a day kind of thing. Uh, uh, every week, just talk about it. So, you so, know, okay. So, hold on. So, your your small group leader training is <laughs> hey, there's this soul commentary I've got on a shelf somewhere. Just you know, read a bit. Let people talk about it. Read this little bit um, from the commentary, and then that's it. I guess then you're done. Yep, basically. <laughs> And like a kid, no training, right? So we would say at the end, I'm like, okay, let's do an Our Father. Let's do a Hail Mary. Like I knew those two prayers, right? You know? I, 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 and, and the cool thing was, in I time, we began, at the reading of scriptures, we actually began to pray for one another and have these like prophetic words for one another. And like there was the ministry of the Holy Spirit going on that – out of nowhere. I mean, we didn't, we were just reading the Bible and it was like, oh, I get this sense, you know, like God wants you to know this. Or like <laughs> so, so hold on, hold on. I have more, I have more questions. It, I, I promise we'll move on, but there's, okay, okay. this is just too interesting. <laughs> so, so is Father Buckle even checking in? Like, are you meeting him on the side, like here and there? Here and like, there, here and there. Yeah. But it's like, not like a, Hey, let's get together. Wasn't like a weekly thing or yeah, or hey, you know, once a month on this day. Like, let me just, you know, it's just he'd be, you'd be like, hey, man, can I ask you about this? This thing, read this thing, or hey, this is what's happening with our little group. Can I ask you about it? And he'd be like, sure, yeah, let's let's hang out. Yeah, no, but it's just kind like, of it's it's just random. It's it's I don't know that Father Puck will ever let a small group Bible study. <laughs> And I don't mean that in a bad way. The guy was really, the guy developed leaders, you know. Um, Apparently, yeah. <laughs> at least one, at least one. That I know of. So this isn't like, again, this, it, these things seem incidental, but they're interesting because people listening are going, can I do that? Or 
is that, can I just tell someone, sure, just do a Bible study or, you know, or is that responsible? Am I being irresponsible if somebody says they're leading, they want to lead a Bible study and I'm like, sure, just do it. I mean, do I need to make sure they do this other thing? Or, you know, there's all these other questions that leaders have in a moment like this, right? Or at least yeah, I've had. And so is the church itself like, is it like a charismatic Catholic church? Is it like, oh, there's lots of Bible studies anyway. They're, you know, they, no, it's just like, no, I don't know, they're just doing no. their thing. Wow. He just kind of like, go for it. You know, and I do think what, what that did teach me was I have been in my life much more apt to release people, to let them go for it, to try to see, you know, <sighs> I was pretty, I was a pretty, you know, messed up kid. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the poster child for being an altar boy or anything, you know, and it like father buckle saw something in me, mm. called it out, said, you invite your friends, you do this, you lead this. And, you know, I think if we do that a little bit more, not, I'm sure pe if people survived whatever misteaching I had, right. You know what I mean? Like, more it would happen was they were in the presence of God and there was something, the Holy Spirit was doing something and the word of God, we were looking at it and handling it as best we could. Yeah. And I think there's power in that. And I think it released it for a wave of people in our community. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that little step he did with you, which you highlighted, that is so important is at least in my experience of my own story and then also having now been leading is the power of getting people to tell their stories quickly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like uh, things happened and if all we do as leaders is facilitate spaces where it's like, Hey, this thing that you just told me, tell these people that tell this person, Go ahead, do it. And they're like, can I do that? Like right now? Yeah, just do it right now. Just like tell the story. Because so many of our stories are really, you know, they seem, I don't know, passe or whatever to us, but they're really powerful when we say them out loud. And all of a sudden we realize, oh, I guess that is really powerful. Like that helps people. When I tell that story, yeah. I guess I should do that some more. And the, the more that that becomes an, a regular part of someone's sort of discipleship journey, it begins to impact them too. There's power in that. And then you create a culture where people are doing that. Yeah. And it seems as though to me, the Holy Spirit moves in that sort of community of testimony in yeah. a way that's different if it's just sort of, there's one guy talking and everybody's trying to learn and listen. And we inadvertently create a world where there's experts and then there's the rest of us. Right. Right. And how much was an expert Samaritan woman went to the, the her, her village or town yeah. and everybody came out. That's well, right. How much theology did she know? This is what he did to me. This is all I know. This, this is all I, I know. know. You got to yep. check this guy out. You got to you got to hear this. Or I love the the blind man, you know, when he's getting prosecuted by the Pharisees, <laughs> John yeah. nine and then 10. And he's like, so let me get this straight. This guy you say is like really sinful and horrible. Open my eyes so I can see you guys can't do that, but somehow he's the bad guy. Okay, whatever. Here's all I know. I don't know anything about him. I was blind and now I see. That's it. That's that's all I got. And they're like, get out of here. You know, we, 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 we don't like this. This is not going very well for us. Get out of here. But the simplicity of a testimony without the frills, without any of the other stuff has power by the spirit. Mm -hmm. And then that creates a certain culture, a way of talking about and experiencing God. That's that's so cool. Okay, so I promise. Now we'll speed up. So, so you do all that stuff. Then you get out of high school. Do you go to university? Do you? Uh, but what, what's your next move? Yeah. So, I was a good wrestler, and so I was getting some scholarship offers. I, Syracuse University had offered me to go there at the time. They were like a top twenty. Yeah, it's a big deal. School. Yeah. That's what I assumed I was going to do. Somebody said, you know, hey, there's Christian colleges. And I got this magazine. <laughs> I didn't even know, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, Syracuse. They don't have a Christian college for, you know, hundreds of miles from here or something or whatever, you know. And I'm like, oh. 
And so the guy sends me a magazine, hands me some, you know, thing with all these Christian colleges. I write three of the wrestling coaches and just say, hey, uh, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Do you think I could come to your school? Like, what do you say? Right. Only one guy got back to me. And it's like, yeah. And I went down. It was Messiah College. Went down there. Uh, I ran into one of the coaches that I'd written to years later and said, hey, you know, did you ever, you know, I wrote that. I'm kind of surprised you didn't write back to me. And he said, I never got your letter. So anyhow, the one guy got the letter. <laughs> and um, so answer your letters, answer your emails. Dude, um, seriously. Yeah. The little admin helps. Yeah. And so I went there and I'd never been in a, that many Christians around together. It was a whole new world to me. It was, I had a Bible course, loved it, switched my major almost instantly to biblical studies. I remember, Jay, I was in this Old Testament survey class, like the first Bible course you got to take, right? And they're telling about David and Goliath. And I'm like, are you kidding? Like, there's these people, you know, preacher's kids, <laughs> yeah, have been, just, had this thing, like, yeah, flannel yeah, yeah, grass yeah. for the last 20 yeah, years. Right. And I'm going, are you kidding me he won like how did that happen like this is like and i'm like almost jumping out of my seat here in this story because we've been doing mark you know what i mean <laughs> right you've been living in mark <laughs> and, and like they're like yeah you've never heard and it was like so alive it was so exciting wow. to me so anyhow got a, a bachelor uh of arts and biblical studies wow ended up going then uh to uh, New York City to the South Bronx, which at that time was considered the, you know, the worst urban area in the country. And, you know, Reagan walked through it and said, you know, there shouldn't be any place like this in the U.S. Mm. And, uh, Jimmy Carter did it four years before. Reagan came back, said, see, nothing's changed. Moved in there and started a, a storefront community center. Well, hold on, um, hold on. That's quite a jump. So, like, what makes Syracuse wrestler getting high kid who goes and does his biblical studies say, you know, my next move, I now have a heart for the most messed up place that I'm aware of in the United States. That's where I'm going. What happens in between? Surely something happens. You know, I, I think I always was for the underdog. I was always, uh, we, we, you know, live pretty close to the edge financially, our family and hmm. uh, times. And so I felt some of that pressure. And I always kind of had this uh, lean towards, you know, uh, you know, the, seeing, seeing the poor cared for, uh, hmm. engaging people in hard spots. Hmm. Um, so I just kind of was just in my mindset it's like an inclination before. like it was I an inclination yeah, that's about good poor people and the folks that feel on the edge and yeah and you're it, you're it sounds i mean from what you're describing you do have a bit of a rough and tumble like i'm a wrestler like whatever like i'm gonna yeah i'm just gonna do this like yeah well, you know the, you know because when i'm listening to you it doesn't sound like you go through the filters of like I mean, am I going to be safe here? Or like, is this like a, like, this isn't a good career move. Like this isn't like, I'm not climbing some ladder. I think early on, uh, the Lord was so gracious. Like he pulls me out of this thing. And mm -hmm. it's this radical, crazy thing that happens. And suddenly I'm leading. And, you know, so all my old friends, you know, I was used to like, you just do the, you it's like, Jesus, I'm just trying to follow Jesus and let the chips fall where they may. Hmm. And so early on, doing some things like that, just even as a senior in high school, a new Christian, helped me understand that God's really faithful. And so whatever he calls it to, it's really just worth doing. Like, we can sit and navel gaze and, you know, worry about all the what ifs. But hmm. if we just do it, and it's not like everything I did turned out well, you know, like, but I think there was that lesson of obedience early on that when, when I'm at my best, I'm doing that. And God's been really very gracious. And a lot of things we've done, like, you know, doing that. And, you know, we at one point, Gwen and I 
uh, moved to, you know, the squatter slums in Bangkok and moved in, you know, right. So illegal, I know illegal yeah, no, no. shanty town. You well, know? That's, so that's what I'm trying to get my mind around. Like I'm listening to your story and I'm trying to see the shifts, right? Like, so I could go to Syracuse to wrestle. No, I'm going to go to Messiah, this small school. I mean, I bet you were the best. Are you still the best wrestler that's ever been in Messiah? <laughs> <laughs> Like, I assume you won every, everything, didn't you? I mean, if it, like, like, like I, mean, I did pretty good. My, my freshman year, I did pretty good. Yes, yeah, I did. I, I, I mean, I mean, so, you know, you, you go, I mean, it would be like, uh, you know, a D1 recruit in basketball is like, no, actually, I'm going to go play at this small Christian school. <laughs> They're like the best they've ever seen. Like, so... So you make that decision. So there's like not a thought in your mind of like bigger, better, faster, cooler. There's no like developmental, like what kind of career am I trying to build here? It's exactly what you're describing. You're going, I think I should just be obedient. And something in the Bible study stuff and some of your own heart says there's something about the poor and going to the places where are most in need. So that's my first move. Let's go to the Bronx. I that's just just really unusual, John. I mean, you've been doing pastor, you've been in ministry. Like there aren't most people are coming out with a biblical biblical studies degree. Don't like get out a map and say where where is it the worst. Let me go do something there. To to this day, right? I mean, that's not my experience, sure. and I'm not judging anyone. Yeah. No, I'm just describing the unique nature of that decision. That's a really unique decision. Anyway, well, maybe we'll spell that as we keep going, because then you go, you go there, you do a storefront. Like, what is it you do? We do. There was this little uh, Dominican um, Mennonite church I came in as a youth person for. They have like eight kids that drive in once a week. And I'm like looking around going, this neighborhood's blown up. Let's start a community center. Wow. So I literally I go out there and go, uh, there's some kids. And it was on the way from the school. Like, this is a broad, like. Most of the buildings are, are boarded up. It was, it was, you know, Fort Apache to Bronx. If you ever remember that movie, that yeah. that's where I'm at, right? And these kids are going by. And so I go out there and say, hey, you guys, kind of like Father Buckle did with me. I go out to these four kids walking. They're like third grade, fourth grade. And I say, hey, um, you want to help me start a community center? And they're like, uh, sure. And so they come in the storefront. <laughs> and I'm going like, hey, I want to do this. Well, what would be fun for people to do? And well, good games. And so we literally make, I have no money. We make a, we get a, a box that was, you know, from the bodega a couple doors down and we make a checkerboard and we get like, uh, you know, beer bottle caps, you know, this one beer and this other beer. And that's, we have a checkerboard now. And that's how we started community center. These guys, these kids came in and helped me build it. Wow. And we start with no money, no anything, just like inviting kids walking by. And uh, I, I was with the Mennonites at the time, and they had this van that I got to use. And I'd take the kids, and we go down in the Upper East Side and, you know, dumpster dive. We got a couch and a ping pong table people were throwing <laughs> out. And we built this community center, you know. <laughs> and those four kids, those first four kids, get saved. Like the same with, like, Father Buck on me. Yeah. Like, here's some raw kid. Come on, let's build something. And these kids, same thing. Wow. And I'll tell you, Jay, the the thing that breaks my heart because I wasn't a, I wasn't a, a trained leader at all. Mm. I didn't have uh, in two years we grew so much that the building came down on us. The church threw us out, and I had no leaders. I had nothing that I never passed it on. It it died after two years when they closed on me and left. Wait, so and they kick you out because they're just like, this is chaos. This chaos is, you have 80 kids, <laughs> you know, from the South Bronx <laughs> coming in as, you know, uh, all kinds of chaos. It's like good chaos, I think. Uh, but chaos. communities being built. Yeah. But chaos. Yeah. Like it was a safe place for kids. We didn't allow fighting. We didn't allow guns. You know, <laughs> it was a safe place. Oh, and wow. That's high bar. Hey, guys. <laughs> No, no fighting. fighting. Okay. That's that's our rule here. No fighting, no getting high. Those that's it. But but to these nice Mennonite people who brought you in, 
They just wanted you to like, you know, just like hang out with these kids, you know, read the Bible here and there. I, th- and, I think probably more that's what they were looking for. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next thing you know, you have like all these kids running around in some like mashed up building with like beer cap checkers and like some like moldy couch you pulled out of a dumpster. And they're like, wait a minute. This is not. This is not what we bargained for. <laughs> I would bring those kids. Some of those kids. I mean, believe it or not. South Bronx, a subway ride to Manhattan, had never been to Manhattan. You know, wow. like, uh, I, I gave them, you know, we worked to, and Gwen, that's what Gwen and I connected, and she was a part of this. And we kind of gave them vision, like, you could have a voice. I brought them mm-hmm. down to protests, like, for, for housing and stuff, you know? Like, wow. it was like this, like, trying to empower, and it was it was a fun time. And I had no idea what I was doing. And there was a lot of brokenness in my life, and, you know. Sure. I it is looking back my biggest failure was nothing lasted hmm. looking back it was the grace of god that pushed me on from that hmm. because if i stayed there by myself i would have never gotten the tools i needed for healing hmm. and training that i got in a vineyard like that leaving there ended up in the long in the in the pretty short run really getting me to move out to Los Angeles where I met the vineyard. quarter on the We Are Vineyard podcast, we focus in on a theme for all of our interviews. This quarter, the theme is power and presence. And every month we introduce a new book or recommended resource to dig in deeper. This month, we're recommending that everyone reads Prayer in the Night by Tish Warren. Later this month, we'll interview Tish to hear a deeper dive on her book and so much more. Prayer in the Night is available through Vineyard Resources and wherever books are sold. So you go from the Bronx, these guys, I mean, I would love, I mean, if we had another two hours, I would want you to go, what was that meeting like? Like, what's the last meeting where they're like, hey, man, this isn't going to work? Or is it just the contract kind of runs up? They're like, hey, we, you know, we committed to a year, we're out of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was, no, this isn't going to work. You are you don't fit. And mm. um you know, and that gave me, I've had two times where I was told I didn't fit hmm. and was chased out of communities of faith. It gives me a sensitivity in the vineyard to help people see, help people discover, do they fit or don't, to help them discover it. Like if I'm telling them you don't fit, that's not a healing moving forward process. But, hmm. and nobody ever did that for me. Like sit down and say, hey, look at Mennonites have this this these are our values do you get those values and i would say no those aren't really mine or or this other church had told me told me you don't fit here you need to go to the vineyard they'll take anybody that's how do that do that because that happens in la right so you go from the bronx and then what makes you go to la i actually stopped in pittsburgh started uh was a supervisor men's homeless shelter and then (laughs) um, so again like this heart for the 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 marginalized and the down and out you're like yeah let's do that Yeah. And I had some friends in Pittsburgh. So I went there. Gwen and I are married. We take this missions course. Do you remember the um, world perspective of the Christian movement or that? Yeah. Perspectives Perspectives of the world Christian movement. Yeah. I've I'm I'm I've we've run it in our church. I've I've been a teacher in it. Yeah. I know it well. Yeah. Rex me. Rex me, Gwen. We Mm. say we got to go. We got to get trained in missionaries. We got to we got to you know, this is we got to get out there. And so they had the U.S. Center for World Mission in L.A. We say, well, let's go there and be trained as missionaries. So we moved to L.A., don't know anybody. I kind of this vow of poverty. We moved with a Greyhound bus. We literally moved on a Greyhound bus. Two circuses of our stuff. So, so we, we moved to L.A. And 
uh, move in this uh, kind of poor Latino neighborhood. Okay, wait, and- so wait, I got to pause real quick. So no one's helping. Like there's not like a leader, a pastor. There's not even like an old professor from Messiah that you're just checking no. in with like, hey man, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, here's my thought. Here's my plan. We're going to pack these two suitcases and we're just going to go to LA. There's mm-hmm. nobody like, I don't know, man, that doesn't sound like a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, no. But, okay. I wish I had somebody. I look back and go, I could have saved a lot of bumps and bruises. <laughs> no, it's okay. I just, I'm just observing. It. Okay. So then you end up in LA. With the no, World I could have. I could have used it. It's a good observation. <laughs> Get out there and mentor somebody. Right. Um, uh, so we move into LA and we're doing this uh, US Center for World Missions. And so some people, you know, brand new. And somebody said, oh, you should go to this church. So we go to this church. And it's kind of a, a more upper class, upper middle class, upper class kind of church. Mm-hmm. And I'm going there. And, you know, I got long hair and I'm kind of fighting materialism at the time. So I'm dressing, uh, you know, I had a couple of pairs of army fatigues and black t-shirts and eventually six months there. And I, the pastor knew I was studying to be a missionary. He says, you know, we need to talk. And I'm thinking he's going to ask me to do a small group. This is like, great. Like, Oh, he's finally seen. I, I, I'd love to do ministry. You know what I'm thinking? He says, we got to talk at church. So he pulls me aside and says, uh, says, Hey, uh, you don't fit here. You, you sh- should go somewhere else. And he flicks his hand, like, you know, like swatting flies, like you should go somewhere else. And I go, I was just like, shot. I go, what? He says, you don't fit here. You need to go somewhere else. He flicks his hand, like flicking me away. Mm. And I'm like stunned. I don't know what to say. I'm hurt. I'm head spinning. And I, I, so all I could think of saying was, well, where should I go? And he literally says to me, you should go to the vineyard. They'll take anyone. Mm. And so I go, you know, there's no internet but vineyard okay i got to find out where the vineyard is and you know it was in santa monica it was the one of ken Dalton, the original one he started mm. and gwen and i get our bus schedules out and it's an hour and 25 minute you know city bus ride to the church meeting in this little this old not little this old uh mexican movie theater and we go there and we walk in and it was like wow it was like it was like we were home, like the worship had just started and it was just like crazy good to worship. The presence of God was there. And I remember we sat up on the up back, you know, it was a movie theater is up in the back because that was the only place there were seats. And we sit there and then the, the Jim Kermath was a was a pastor and he preached the word and it was it was powerful and practical. And and then there's like ministry time out there, and it was like we we're just blown away. And mm. we were like, that's where we belong. And like, you know, they make announcements. They're, they're caring for the poor and they have this homeless thing they're doing. And, you know, so right away I run into this church that is like caring for the poor mm. is biblically based, powerfully deep in the word is, wow. has worship and, and uh, Holy spirit movement. And that's where we connected with them. That was 1984. Mm. And that was where we connected with the vineyard. It was powerful. Yeah. Cause now you're in. Now so, so you're riding the bus an hour plus each way. Hour and twenty five minutes was the bus. <laughs> wow. That said, yeah, and and you're going up for Sundays, and I mean, just having known vineyards, and then you're in some kind of small group somewhere, and yeah. then you're showing up for the extra prayer training night on the whatever, and then so so you're just like you're like just logging hours on buses, showing up in all these things. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And it's good. We got in a small group and it was great. So, but then at the same time, you're doing all the world missions training. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and so about three and a half years, I'm part of that church getting trained. And then they actually send us to Bangkok. Hmm. And (laughs) we're we're being sent out, right? (laughs) And so we're going to be up front. They're going to pray for us. And I said, you know, hey, Gwen, I'll, I'll take you. I'll, I'll, I'll do the talk. Yeah, yeah, you know, she Gwen doesn't like the public speak. So, yeah, that'd be great. I get up there and he's st- and we have a six month old baby now at this time. And so I'm up there holding my six month old baby 
And, you know, Jim, the pastor, about before prayer, he'll explain what we're going to do. And I start saying it and I start weeping and I can't get a word out. I'm just like so overwhelmed by the moment that this church I love has sent us out. We're going to lead them. And uh, just every day, the presence of God in me. And I just start crying. And Gwen, like, calmly explains what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and they pray for us. You know? <laughs> Which what you're doing is, in, in your mind, were you planting a vineyard church? Yes. So you're planting yeah. a vineyard church in Bangkok. And you know how many people in Bangkok? Uh, none. We know. We know. <laughs> we start when we're in L.A., we were, you know, we said we got to learn Thai as much as you can, learn a Thai culture. So this is classic. If you know me, you know how much this is my heart. Uh, there's a donut shop that's some Thai zone. So we start hanging out at the donut <laughs> shop and become friends with these Thai family. Uh, and so when we go to Thailand, they're like, you go to stay with our family when you first get there. So we stay with this Thai family and they hook us up with this woman of peace, this Buddhist woman who's called the angel of the slums, grew up in the slums and organized, incredible leader. And um, we go and meet her and she helps us find, you know, you can't just like as a, an American guy walk in and just find a place to rent in the slums, you know? <laughs> and she comes in and she says, she finds us a place to rent and, uh, you know, Kung Petit is for you, then they're, they'll protect you. And we became part of that community. Uh, so we did know one family, and we stayed with them for like the first. And how many times had you been to Bangkok before you moved? Two times. So you visit two times. You have the I'm assume a prophetic call, like this is where God's asking us yeah. to go. Yeah. You show up with the help of a Buddhist woman who's a woman of peace, and then you just start doing stuff. I mean, is it like the Bronx again? Like we're now like. Well, it was much di- like. We moved in and we we had to learn language. We had to learn the culture. Uh, Gwen, I was going to try to plant a church. Gwen was going to, um, she has her master's from UCLA in community development, uh, community uh, health. And so she was going to uh, work on developing like a small scale health clinic there mm. kind of thing. You know, we just tried to learn language, build relationship. Mm pray for people. It was very slow. It was, we were there a year when we were getting good with the language and we're starting to get a little ground. But at that point, as you can well imagine, we got sick. Uh, Gwen got, Gwen got very sick. And basically the doctor says, you know, if you don't, if you don't go home at this point, you may die. Mm. So um, we came back and that was honestly, that was probably the lowest point of my life. I came back. I've I've enjoyed getting older. I came back. It was my 29th birthday. Hmm. And I came back and I'm I'm at my I'm we're literally living at my mom's house with you know a year and a half old kid now. And I'm like, what a loser. I'm living at my house. I don't have a job. I failed in my calling. I'm no good. i I mean I hmm. really it was the lowest moment, and I'm, and I'm almost 30. I kept saying, I'm almost 30, and I'm in this place. And, you know, I Gwen had more faith at that moment than I did. Hmm. Um, long story short, the Santa Monica Vineyard, this is about a month and a half, two months in. We get a job, and Gwen says, you should call the Santa Monica Vineyard. Let them know, Jim, he's been so good to you. Hmm. Let him know. So I call back, and I say, look, we're about to take this job. I just, uh, you know, I'm doing it. He says, look at I would like to hire you to come back and be on our staff. Mm. So that they hire us to come. And I became the um, uh, f- children and family pastor in Santa Monica Vineyard. West LA, it's called now. That was life. Like mm. so much healing went on there. Really much more training and praying for the sick and understanding the move of the Holy Spirit and how to be a pastor. I learned a lot there. Uh, that oh. shaped me more than anything. That's so cool. Uh, wow. Yeah. And so then how long are you there before you moved back to Syracuse to plant? About three and a half years. So three and a half years there. Wow. And so when you think back on that window, like Bangkok, in Syracuse for a minute, you know, trying to just lick your wounds, back in Santa Monica, 
what would you want to tell that kid in his mom's basement, you know, 29 year old who's like, what's the point of my life? Like now, after all these years of being able to process that. Yeah. And like, man, we did this thing in Bangkok and we got sick and then we're just home. Like what? God, I thought we were trying to listen to you and how is this happening? Yeah. I think the things I learned was one, you keep trusting God. Like mm -hmm. he's got this thing. It's okay to fail. I mean, you think about it. At this point, I've failed twice. Hmm. Like I failed in New York. That community center closed and there's nothing that lasted. I went to Bangkok, this idea again to plant a church and it doesn't make it. I don't make it. And here I am failed twice. But each one of those, I really needed. Looking back, they touched. Bangkok broke me to a point where, you know, before that, honestly, I was full of myself, you know, mm. and I, I needed that kind of utter stripping down to feet to really learn a little, like, this is all about Jesus. Like, I can't do this on my own. Yeah. Um, so there's that. It's okay to, to learn from your lessons of, of, of those things, but it's okay to, to try and fail. Mm -hmm. Um, but keep listening to the Holy Spirit. And, yeah. I, you know, all things work for the good of those who love the Lord, for those who are called according to his purpose. Yeah. And I look back and I needed each one of those steps to become what I'm what I'm doing now. You know, I, I needed those things. Hmm. That's so cool. So then after three years there, you're like, I think I'm going to go back to Syracuse and plant a church. Yeah, it was a call to plant a church. It was wow. a pretty supernatural thing. And then... um and then it was a call to Syracuse, very specifically. Like we were looking at LA, we were looking, going back to New York City, right? Uh, Pittsburgh, where we had friends, uh, Gwen's from the Jersey Shore. We were looking at those places and uh, God just like spoke, gave us uh, uh, Genesis 31, three. I'm praying, I'm like, God, we fa I, I fast for 18 days to hear from the Lord. And mm. it was like, we need to know what you, where you want us. And it's, the address Genesis thirty one three comes and it's uh and it says hey, God said to Jacob I'm sending you to the land of your fathers and I will bless you and that was Syracuse you know this is my family this is my roots wow oh so really clearly so we came here and that was nineteen ninety one nineteen ninety one and then you just so come no team but you're you're a hometown we did boys, have a team. you know we did, did. Team. how many folks yeah. came we had there was. All told, like not everybody was able to come at once. We had five that came at once, counting Gwen and I. And then there were another four, another five that came hmm. over the next year, um, year and a half. Uh, so if you look at the migration maps in, in the United States in 1990, you know, census, there's this huge arrow going from the northeast to L.A., if you look really closely, you'll see 10 of us going up back to Syracuse. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's not a common migration pattern. That LA. was not. No, no. <laughs> to Syracuse. Syracuse. <laughs> that original five, two of them had never seen snow before. Wow. And I said, oh, don't worry. It's not that bad. <laughs> I lied through my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> it is so bad. Yeah. I mean, it is really cold. Okay. So you do all those things. Then you kind of, I assume you do like the normal old school way, like small group that we multiply, then we end up in some kind of temporary place. We grow a bit. Wasn't it? Did you have a pizza place? Is that what I remember? We were above a pizza shop. That's right. Yeah. Above a pizza shop. <laughs> Nothing like the smell of pizza while you're doing communion. <laughs> <laughs> so you're above a pizza shop. And listen, I mean, if people don't know, you know, the Syracuse Vineyard, John, I mean, you built this church that's just trained leaders, sent them all over the place. So many pastors are even pastoring other churches came through being trained in your church. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing church. Well, You've done you. such a good job. It's so encouraging. And yet then somehow you decide, hey, there's this new plan in the vineyard to hire for this national team. I think I'll apply. So, so you, you decide to apply after much prayer and consternation because you love your church and you love what you do. 
Talk a little bit about how, wh what you feel called to do in this new role. Like out of all the things you've learned, you've been all over the place, you've been a regional leader, you've been a regional church planting coordinator, you've done all kinds of things in the vineyard. Tell me a little bit about this role and what you feel like God's calling you to in this window, what you're excited about for it. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I wasn't looking for this role. In fact, I kind of resisted it. Like people say, so you throw your hat in, you should throw your hat in. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah. I love, I love the Sy Syracuse Vineyard. I love pastoring, I, the local church. I, mm. I love what I do. I had no desire to move, but uh, we threw a fleece out the Lord. Somebody needs to give us a word that wasn't connected at all. It was a, uh, an outsider of Vineyard USA, and that happened. And so we threw our hat and went through the process, which was very rigorous, very good process. Like you guys screened people and had lots of voices in there. I had people interviewing me I'd never met, you know, like, who's this person? Uh, yep. So it was a really good process. I think you guys did great with that. I really feel like the Lord has called me here because of one, my experience, learning, you know, leadership development. First, I have a love for the local church mm -hmm. and everybody on a national team, actually, I'm impressed, has this passion and love for the local church like they want the local church to succeed they want the local pastors to succeed mm -hmm. and that's a passion of my heart you know and i i love you know my in my time as a vineyard pastor i have you know pastored a lot of pastors in these different roles and so i i really love that to help people move forward i love building community and you know one of the big emphasis of the new team in the, in the reorg is that we're going to be a family. We're going to be a healthy family and we're going to, you know, you can't just be out there and not connect. And, and so the process that all the SRLs are going through is really helping people connect, mm -hmm. helping to bring healing. And I, I love that to be able to help people get past things that happen that some of them were bad that, that, you know, we're all broken people. And so we hurt each other Yeah, and help people get through that hurt and that pain so we can be a healthy family. Um, and I love doing that, like building community, caring for the local pastor, coaching pastors, um, casting vision and really raising up leaders. Yeah. I think there's so much uh, potential leaders in the vineyard, the better we, find those and raise those up, you know, pull a father buckle on some of them. And, you know, I believe in what the vineyard's doing, like helping people connect with Jesus and bring the power and presence of the kingdom. That's mm -hmm. like, I'm in, you know, yeah. and that's what we want to do. And, uh, you know, to, that we're going to start and support local churches that relate to one another. I want to help that happen. Yep. I've really, you know, it's been six months and I'm, I'm processing still out of my, my church, but I've loved being a part of this team and, working working with um the people i've gotten to meet and work with so far in the vineyard what what's been the biggest surprise because you know you've had you know you've had national exposure in all kinds of different ways but in this chair now you're engaging much more broadly not just in the eastern region not just within the lens of maybe church planning or something but you're getting a wider view of the whole vineyard across the country. What what has been the biggest surprise? What's been the thing you're like, wow, this is different? Because yeah, I, I didn't, imagine. I didn't have as that much of a national view. I've just been an Eastern Region guy, right? And have loved it. And there's been a couple of surprises. One, there's a lot of great people all through the vineyard. Yeah, and I'm I'm proud to be a part of this group of people. But I also noticed that there's a lot of pain dysfunctional relationships and yeah. I, you know i hate to say that but there's no it's I've bumped into a lot of that yeah and, well and uh, you've had your microcosm which is different than what you're experiencing across the country you're going wait a minute there's a lot of areas where people n maybe necessarily haven't been meeting together all the time or they don't have a longevity of relationship or yeah. some of the fruit of what maybe you've seen in the eastern region of different kinds of church planting and mutual support of one and one another's churches where we kind of pull together for a youth thing or we pull together for a worship process. It's like, I, I mean, you've just been reporting to me over and over like, man, there's a, there's a lot of gaps where people just haven't either thought to do that or they've been scraping it out or there's been pain, things that they've not known how to process. And we have a new opportunity with that. Yeah. 
And then seeing that, I understand why God called me to. I think I can help in helping people process through some painful relationships that breach trust and mm-hmm. how to rebuild that and how to, um, you know, help people connect mm-hmm. or help people discern, like, is this the group of people I want to connect with? Yeah. And, and then in a loving way, help people say, oh, yeah, maybe this isn't the group or maybe it is. And, mm-hmm. and I really have, I really am very excited about the reorg and the new team and what we're doing because I think I envision in, in five to 10 years, I, I think that the level of connectedness among our churches is going to be very high. I think when there's unity too, I think it allows the Holy Spirit to flow way more. So we're going to see more of the, the, the you know, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit moving, the kingdom coming. Um, I, I just see real health and the kind of a clear call uh, moving forward and moving forward together. Mm. Uh, you know, so, and I, I think this role of uh, SRLs, uh, we'll figure out a new name for that sometime. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> you know, it's it's like now there are like three people full time who get up every morning. Yep. And, uh, you know, I know for Brenda, Joel, myself, that every morning we get up and we're thinking, how can we help the local church? What, what you know, we got our hands in helping someone through crisis. We've got a hand in casting vision, empowering leaders, uh, bringing healing. And that's that's like a 150 hours a week that we never had yep. that's going into caring for local churches and pastors. Yep. And I just see that that's going to, that's going to reap incredible dividends, I think. Amen. Well, John, I'm, I'm so grateful that you applied, even though you were like, why would I do this? And that the Lord led you and spoke to you. Cause you're doing such a great job, all your experience, the things you described and so much more, you've just been, tirelessly investing in the vineyard for decades at this point. And this window of your life, it would have been really easy to just put it on cruise control. You know, I'm just going to help this church do the next thing. But you and the Lord led you to take all the amazing things you've gotten to do in Syracuse and then spread those throughout the vineyard as a whole. And I'm I'm just so grateful. Thank you for being willing to do it. And and plus, you're a blast. We, we laugh a lot when we get to be together as a team. <laughs> We did. That's I, fun. I actually thought this. I was I was thinking about this at the beginning. I forgot to say it. I think the first time I met you and asked you, "Well, tell me about what your church is like," and you were like, "We're a Tommy Boy church. I'm I'm Tommy Boy." <laughs> Tommy I used to say, "I'm the Tommy Boy of the vineyard." I, I, Tommy uh, Boy of the vineyard. Stumble I back uh, backwards into something or other. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, you're way more than that, but it's. But you might also be the Tommy Boy of the Vineyard. So that's also <laughs> good. Yeah, I'm really grateful for that. Well, thanks, John. Thanks for making time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jay. And Jay, thank you. I think you're doing a great job as national director. I just want to say that you're leading and trying to communicate in a healthy way. Mm. And thank you. I know that's hard. And you're doing a great job at that. Thanks, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it, there's a lot to learn. But I definitely feel called, just like you. I felt called by God. So I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity. Learning a lot. <laughs> I'm sure. All right. Talk soon, man. The We Are Vineyard podcast is a production from the team at Vineyard USA. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. Leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Connect with us online for additional resources. Our website is vineyardusa.org. And we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at at Vineyard USA. Thanks for listening. See you next week.